Hello, and welcome to Stand With Us Connect. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are all around the world. <clears throat> it's great to connect with you. Today's webinar is the Jewish judge who stood up to the Third Reich. My name is Jonathan Bell, and I am the Associate Director for the Stand With Us Side Off Legal Department. The Stand With Us Side Off Legal Department is accessible, efficient, and responsive. We analyze anti-Semitic and anti-Israel incidents, work with students and community members to determine the appropriate response and bring all of Stand With Us resources to bear. We work daily with Stand With Us campus coordinators, regional staff, student fellows, community members, and partner organizations to remain constantly informed of potentially actionable matters, making us uniquely positioned to be the first responders to anti-Semitism and anti-Israel activity. Today's webinar is the second in a series of legal webinars where we will explore various legal topics through a Jewish or Israeli lens. We will have information on upcoming legal webinars out shortly and look forward to having you join us. All legal webinars are approved for California Continuing Legal Education Credit for Attorneys. California CLE credit is transferable in several jurisdictions outside of California. We will provide a certification to all attorneys who are verified as attending today's webinar who sent in their attorney license number beforehand. Your state bar association can verify if the credit is transferable and we are happy to assist you with that process. Now I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Carrie Lerman. Carrie is a partner in the Los Angeles office of Munger, Tolls and Olson, where he focuses on litigating insurance coverage disputes and other claims in state and federal courts. He is a fellow of the American College of Coverage Council. Mr. Lerman's practice also includes complex business litigation and international arbitrations. He frequently teaches at law schools in what was formerly the Soviet Union, where he emphasizes the indispensable role played by the rule of law, free speech, independent judiciary, free and independent press, and a well-educated legal profession to establishing and maintaining a democracy. He has taught at law schools in Kazan and Samara in, Russian, in Russia, in Odessa in Ukraine, and in Baku, Azerbaijan. He organized the first ever Russian client counseling competition among Russian law schools, and the winner participated in the international client counseling competition in Australia. Additionally, Mr. Lerman is very active in the Jewish community in Los Angeles and is on the board of directors of Sinai Temple. He frequently lectures on Jewish and legal topics, often highlighting little known or forgotten episodes in US history that show the critical role played by American Jews in securing the liberties we enjoy today. He is a graduate of the University of Illinois and UCLA School of Law. I am honored to welcome Carrie Lerman. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, and I wanna thank you for all the help you've been in uh, setting this up. Uh, I also wanna thank um, Paul Garbulski and Noah Rahman of Stand With Us. They've been inordinately helpful. And also from my own office, Jessica Cardenas, uh, our, one of our IT specialists. And of course, I wanna thank Stand With Us legal department which has been so instrumental in making sure that uh, on college campuses in the United States, the First Amendment rights are available to all of our students. Well, today mention the word Nazi or swastika or Hitler, and most people in the US will feel revulsion, conjuring up an image of evil, un unbounded violence. There are still small numbers of neo-Nazis and skinheads today, and we do need to be concerned about them. But right now they're on the fringes of society and beyond the norms of, uh, of decent society. But it was not always that way, even in this country. Hitler took power in Germany in 1933. And by 1935, with the passage of the Nuremberg Laws, he had denied citizenship to German Jews and was well on his way to dehumanizing Jewish citizens and setting up the stage for mass murder of European Jews. I'm gonna tell the story about a courageous Jewish judge who in 1935 dared to call out the murderous German regime for what it really was. But first, it's important for us to take a front seat into what it was like in the mid 1930s so that we can have a sense of the perspective and the context within which this judge, Judge Louis Brodsky operated. It's hard to believe from our own perch in 2020 that in the 1930s in the United States, there were many who praised Adolf Hitler. There were over 100 anti-Semitic organizations springing up across the country. They had names like Friends of New Germany, formed in 1933 with uh, 10,000 members. This organization was actually established with the direct help 
of the Deputy Führer of Germany, Rudolf Hess. It was succeeded by the German American Bund. There were organizations like the Silver Legion of America, also called the Silver Shirts, also founded in 1933, and the Christian Front and many others. They held public rallies, paraded through the streets in uniforms carrying Nazi flags, even in the city of New York. They published vile magazines and openly spoke of their hatred for Jews. Now, prominent individuals in this country were openly anti-Semitic, even though they denied the label. Charles Lindbergh was a national hero. As you all know, he was the first person to fly nonstop from the United States to Paris. He was also an ardent sympathizer of Nazi Germany. On September 11, 1941, only three months before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and with Germany firmly in control of Europe and well on its way to Moscow, Lindbergh gave a speech claiming that the three most important groups conspiring to drag the United States into war, quote, British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration. He called American Jews, quote, un-American, close quote. In words that echo the canards of anti-Semites today, here's what he said, quote, their greatest damage to this country lies in the large ownership and influence in our motion pictures, our press, our radio, and our government. Wendell Wilkie, the Republican candidate for president in 1940, called it, quote, the most un-American talk made in my time by any person of national reputation. Lindbergh was rightly denounced as an anti-Semite. Then there was Charles, then there was, um, then there was Charles Coughlin, a priest. He had a weekly radio show that reached tens of millions of people. He spewed venomous anti-Semitic attacks regularly. He was so popular that a, a post office was established in his parish just to receive the 80,000 or so pieces of mail he got every single week. He had a journal called Social Justice. It had over a million sus subscribers. And his radio uh, talks claimed that Nazi violence against Jews was justified as retaliation for Jewish communism. And I don't wanna forget Henry Ford, one of the richest and most prominent men in America. He established a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, circulation of 900,000, the second largest circulation of any newspaper in the country at that time. It had article after article of venomous anti-Semitic attacks. Then he published a four volume set called The International Jew, and it claimed that Jews had thrust the world into World War I and claimed that Jewish financiers were destroying the banking system. And then he financed the publication of 500,000 copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This infamous anti-Semitic forgery was used to incite programs in Russia and was actually used in Nazi Germany in classrooms as if it were fact. In 1921, Philip Graves of the Times of London exposed it as a fraud. Later that year, the New York Times published an entire page citing Graves' discovery, and the headline was, quote, proof that the Jewish protocols were forged, close quote. There's no way that Henry Ford missed that article, but it certainly did not dismay, dissuade him or diminish his anti-Semitic fervor. As late as July 1938, about one year before the war began, he was awarded the Grand Cross of the German Ego, the highest award that Germany awarded to a non-German. I had mentioned the German-American Bund. It claimed that it was, quote, an organization of patriotic Americans of German stock, close quote. It operated over 20 youth and training camps, including in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. Its membership numbered in the tens of thousands, with 70 regional divisions across the country. They had Hitler youth camps. They had parades. They held rallies at Madison Square Garden, attended by over 20,000 people. The Nazi flag was openly and proudly displayed by them, right alongside the American flag. The swastika was evident. It was not an easy time for Jews. This, we we're talking about the 1930s. Now I wanna talk about a boat. This boat is called the SS Bremen. It was built by Germany in 1929. It was the fastest, most luxurious passenger cruise liner ever built up to that time. 
It had the most advanced steam turbine engine. It sparked competition with France and, and England to create the fastest, most luxurious liner. It was the pride of Germany. It featured an automatic pilot called Metal Mike that allowed the ship to go right through the fiercest storms. It could accommodate 2,200 passengers, about 1,000 crew members, and had every conceivable amenity, including a rifle range, multiple swimming pools, ballrooms, restaurants, a daily newspaper with a circulation of 2,000. Its principal run would start in Germany, pick up passengers in England and France, and then head to the US, where it would dock in the lower bay of the New York Harbor on the Hudson River. By 1933, it had established a record as the fastest ship in the Atlantic crossing, both east and west. Celebrities of all kinds, politicians, artists, diplomats, the upper crust, non-Jews and Jews, paid steep prices to travel on the Bremen. It was cool and people boasted of having been a passenger. But even non-passengers could rejoice on the ship. Every evening prior to leaving New York for their return voyage back to Germany, from 11 p.m. to midnight, one could buy a ticket for a Tinseltown champagne celebration on board the Bremen. As many as five to 7,000 pe people, non-passengers, would dress up in their finest clothes and board the Bremen for drinks, music, dancing, before being ordered off the boat at midnight so the boat could go back to Germany. Enter Adolf Hitler. In 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. And in 34, he became Fuhrer over the entire German Empire and the German people. He assumed complete and absolute power over Germany. He immediately began incorporating Nazi ideology into every facet of German life, including on German passenger cruise ships. The crew of the Bremen was indoctrinated in Nazi ideology. The boat, like all German boats, included an official Nazi cell to oversee everything that happened on the boat. And there was even a unit of the brown-shirted SA stormtroopers on the boat. And then the Nazi flag. The Nazis treated it with reverence. It could not be left alone. It could not lean against anything. It could not touch the ground. It always had to be attended to. No Jew was allowed to touch that flag. Hitler ensured that the swastika flag, proudly triumphing the ascendancy of the German regime, was proudly displayed on the stern of every German registered ship, including the Bremen. Crew members would routinely gather around the flag to pledge their allegiance to Hitler in a vigorous Zig Heil. Enter 1935. Hitler is solidly in command of Germany. The SS Bremen has been completely Nazified. But this did not stop Americans from booking a berth on the ship or paying to be a midnight reveler from 11 to 12 at night before the ship sailed. You see, there was no war. The United States had diplomatic relations with Germany and did not want to offend another country, no matter how odious its policies. Americans did not want to be pulled into a war in Europe. American isolationism was strong, and as noted, Nazi Germany enjoyed not insignificant support among some segments of the United States citizenry. Enter Bill Bailey and five of his colleagues. Now, this is not the Bill Bailey of the song, Won't You Come Home to Bill Bailey. This is Bill Bailey, who at the time was a 20-year-old member of one of the more politically active Siemens unions. He was a fierce anti-Nazi, and he was a communist. He and his fellow union members planned an act of defiance against Nazi Germany. They wanted to do something big, a big splash. So on July 26, 1935, they put on their best clothes and blending in with passengers and the non-passengers, the ones who bought tickets for the champagne celebration, they sneaked on board the Bremen at 11.30 p.m. There were 1,300 passengers on board, 1,000 crew members, 4,800 non-passenger party goers, over 7,000 people. A spotlight shone brightly on the Nazi flag. The Bremen Six, as they were later called, sneaked up to the flag and overcoming resistance by the German crew and even New York police, pulled down the flag, the proud symbol of a murderous regime, and they plunged it into the Hudson River. 
The outcry was immediate. The press in the United States was highly critical of the incident. Even the Washington Post called it a quote, a gross and irresponsible violation of international law. The German government was outraged by the attack. They demanded the US apologize and insisted that they throw the book at the Brennan Six. The State Department did immediately apologize and tried to minimize the incident as a local matter. It would not go away. The Bremen Six were arrested and they were charged with unlawful assembly and assault on a New York police officer. Enter Judge Louis B. Brodsky. Louis Brodsky was just two years old when his parents arrived in New York from Russia to avoid the pogroms. He became a successful lawyer and then accepted a position as a magistrate in the New York State Court. This was a fairly low level position on the court. He was a proud and active Jew, devoting almost all his free hours to Jewish causes. He was also an unabashed, outspoken opponent of Nazi Germany and a supporter of a worldwide boycott against German goods. He was 52 years old when the case of the Bremen Six came to his courtroom. It was just a random assignment and it arrived on his bench. The main legal issue was a simple one. Was there enough evidence against the Bremen Six to warrant a trial on the charge of unlawful assembly and assault of a New York policeman? After several days of hearing, where he heard from witnesses who were aboard the Bremen Six, all of them policemen, Judge Brodsky found that the evidence was not sufficient to support a trial on unlawful assembly, but he did not stop there. He could have, he could have kept his head down and issued a bland legal ruling. That's all he was called upon to decide. Instead, he put into practice what Martha Luther King warned of years later, quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Judge Brodsky was not going to be silent. He unleashed a verbal assault that was heard around the world. He issued a 14 page decision that contained biting words, including the following, quote, it may well be that the flying of this emblem, meaning the Nazi flag in New York Harbor was rightly or wrongly regarded by these defendants and others of our citizenry as a gratuitously brazen flaunting of an emblem which symbolizes all that is antithetical to the American ideals of the God-given and inalienable rights of all people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That in their minds, this emblem of the Nazi regime stands for and represents the suppression of the blessed trinity of free speech, freedom of the press, and lawful assembly, a revolt against civilization. In brief, if I may borrow a biological concept, an atavistic throwback to the pre-medieval, if not barbaric, social and political conditions, close quote. Then he continued further. He did not want to mince any words. He said, quote, nor am I unmindful of the fact that to these defendants, again, rightly or wrongly, the prominent display of this emblem even carried with it the same sinister implications as a pirate ship sailing defiantly into the harbor of a nation, one of whose ships it has just scuttled with the black flag of piracy proudly flying aloft. In a large sense, indeed, it might seem as though whatever disturbances attended the sailing of the Bremen were provoked by this flaunting of an emblem to those who regarded it as a defiant challenge to society." Close quote. Judge Broski referred to the events in Germany as barbaric. He called the Nazi regime and flag an obnoxious emblem. Yes, he said, the Nazi regime was no more than a collection of pirates and their prize symbol was nothing more than a pirate's flag, a provocation to decent citizens of society. Well, as you might imagine, the reaction was immediate and fierce. The press in the United States complained that Judge Brodsky went beyond judicial norms. The Nazi regimes went into high alert. Their newspaper said that Judge Brodsky's words were a greater insult than the tearing down of the flag. They demanded the State Department investigate and take action against Judge Brodsky. Secretary of State Hull issued a statement that they regretted Judge Brodsky's expressions, which he said were offensive to Germany. This was actually the third apology by the United States government. Secretary of State Hull in carefully crafted diplomatic language said, 
quote, the department is constrained to feel that the magistrate in commenting upon the incident, unfortunately, so worded his opinion as to give the reasonable and definite impression that he was going out of his way adversely to criticize the German government, which criticism was not a relevant or legitimate part of his judicial uh, decision, close quote. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda, propaganda minister, viciously attacked Judge Brodsky. He called him a foreigner and a, quote, Eastern Jew, close quote, who dared to speak for the United States. Even Adolf Hitler got involved. Hitler thought that the German papers were not playing up this incident enough, and he insisted that all German papers express their outrage at Judge Brodsky. Local Nazis in New York staged a massive protest at Madison Square Garden. Judge Brodsky was vilified in the press of many countries. Yes, he made enemies, but as Winston Churchill once said, you have enemies, good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life, close quote. Judge Brodsky, this first generation immigrant, stood his ground. He would not back down. No apology from him. He stood tall. Alexander Pope once wrote that, quote, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, close quote. But Cary Grant in the movie, The Bishop's Wife, turned it around when he said, quote, angels rush in where fools fear to tread, close quote. We mortals sometimes need a little nudge from the angels. And like the angels in Jacob's dream, they have, maybe they descended to earth to nudge Judge Brodsky to speak when so many others would not. If a magistrate uh, had uttered similar words in Germany, he would have been shot. If he had uttered similar things in the Soviet Union, he would have been shot. If he were a judge in many of the Western democracies in the 1930s, he would have been dismissed or censored. But here in the United States, despite unheard of pressures, nothing happened. He remained a respected sitting judge until he retired years later. The right to free speech and an independent judiciary, two guardians of our democracy, gave Judge Brodsky the assurance that he could use his bench to deliver a critical message of truth and decency to the citizens of this country and to the world. Louis Brodsky is a testament to this great country of ours where an immigrant can become a judge and a judge can use his bully pulpit without fear of reprisal to say what needs to be said. Postscript. What became of the SS Bremen? When it was returned to Germany after the incident, two of its officers were arrested and put into prison. One year after the flag incident, the captain of the Bremen was so-called retired and replaced by Adolf Ahrens, a committed Nazi. The ship's last trip to New York was on August 28, 1939, just a couple of days before Germany invaded Poland. The Bremen left New York Harbor on August 29 with only the crew on board, over 900, in a hasty departure, the crew was convinced the United States was going to seize the ship. And after the ship left the harbor, the crew sang the Horst Wissel song, the Nazi party uh, anthem, and they raised their hand in the Nazi salute. The ship then went on a three-month harrowing journey to try to get back to Germany. It played a cat and mouse game with the Royal Navy, convinced that the Royal Navy was going to sink it. After taking refuge in a harbor in, in Russia, which at that time was allied with Germany, finally, the Bremen arrived back in Germany in December 1939. During World War II, it was used as a barracks for German troops, and the Nazis planned to use it as a transport troop for the planned invasion of Great Britain, Operation Sea Lion. Fortunately, the air campaign between the Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe put a halt to German invasion plans. In 1941, the liner was set ablaze by a crew member with a personal grudge. And, and in 1946, much of the remains of the boat were destroyed by explosives. But part of her double hull can still be seen today off the coast of Blixen, Germany, an ignoble end to an infamous boat. And what became of the Nazi flag? At the time of the Bremen Six, at the time they tore down the flag and plunged it into the Hudson River, the Nazi flag was one of two official symbols of, of Germany, with the tricolor Imperial Germany flag being the other. On September 15, 1935, in direct response to the Bremen incident, 
and only nine days after Judge Brodsky's ruling, the Reichstag passed a law that declared the Nazi, the swastika flag, the only and exclusive national flag of Germany. After the war, the first law enacted by the Allied Control Council, that's the governing council for all four zones of occupied Germany, abolished all symbols of the Third Reich, including the Nazi flag. Today, the importation or display of the flag is outlawed in Germany. And what of Judge Brodsky? He left his judgeship in 1939 at the end of his term, and he disappeared from history. He went back to practicing law. He remained a proud and active Jew in civil life. He died in 1970 at the age of 86. Well, this is all fine and good, and we can be proud of this judge. He minced no words when words of truth were needed to be said, and needed to be said in public by respected leaders. We know he was speaking the truth, and we delight in what he had to say. And the fierce reaction of the Nazi government makes me only prouder. But is that only because we agree with him? Let's step out of our perspective for a second and ask some difficult questions. Was he correct as a judge to go beyond what he needed to do? All he was required to decide was whether there was sufficient evidence to bind the defendants over for trial. He did not have to characterize the policies of the Nazi regime, no matter how odious those policies were. In fact, at the time, Justice Benjamin Cardoza, the second Jew to be named to the Supreme Court, was highly critical of Judge Brodsky. In private papers, he wrote, quote, what is the use of striving for standards of judicial propriety if one condones such lapses, close quote. What if a judge in 1935 used his bench to compliment the Third Reich on its anti-communist policies or its law and order programs or its success in full employment? Would we see that judge as abusing his judicial role? Or what about judge today who in deciding whether to permit, uh, to permit a pro-Zionist to speak on campus in the face of fierce and potentially violent opposition by, let's say, the Students for Justice in Palestine, let's say this judge went out of his way to characterize the state of Israel in unflattering ways. Would we be sanguine about that? So setting aside my own and perhaps our collective pride about Judge Brodsky's remarks, I do see it raising some broader issues and I wanna outline four of them in no particular order. First, should judges use their benches to proclaim their privately held views? If Judge Brodsky had said the same words, but at a meeting of Stand With Us in 1935, and I must say, if only we had Stand With Us in 1935 when we really needed them, and thank God we have Stand With Us today. And if he said these things as a private citizen, would it have, att would it have attracted international attention? I think not. It was the fact that a judicial officer, a representative of the government made these remarks that evoked such a reaction. Did he abuse his position by giving his opinion? Second, what's the proper role of the court? Is it to decide the narrowest, is it to decide on the narrowest possible grounds a dispute brought before it? By allowing or even encouraging judges to advocate political views, are we undermining the limited function of the courts? We have the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, each with their own defined spheres of legitimacy, and each making up a system of checks and balances. This gives integrity and stability to our system. When a judge encroaches upon the role of the one of the other two branches, does it erode the separation of powers and ultimately threaten judicial independence? And number three, speaking of judicial independence, this is one of the great hallmarks of our constitutional democracy. Each of us is more secure in our liberties and our rights because we have an independent judiciary to protect our rights. Politically active judges threaten the independence of the judiciary. Perhaps that's why Canon 5 of the Code of Conduct for Federal Judges says that judges should refrain from political activity. Each time a judicial officer acts like other government servants, do we risk chipping away judicial independence. I periodically teach law at law schools of the former Soviet Union, and many of my students actually snicker with disbelief when I tell them about our independent judiciary and how judges here are by, are by design of the system insulated from political pressures. For them, they see their judicial system as just another part of the political system. 
they have a hard time believing me about an independent judiciary because it's just not that way in their country. Do we risk sacrificing that judicial independence when judges become just another oracle for politics? Fourth and finally, do judges who step outside their role of deciding specific disputes risk undermining the effectiveness of court rulings and respect for the courts themselves? I'm reminded of an often told story. When the French foreign minister, Pierre Lavelle, suggested to Joseph Stalin that he should ease up on Catholics in order to court favor with the Pope, Stalin is reported to have responded, quote, the Pope? How many divisions has he got, close quote? Uh, by the way, as an aside, there's another story that when the Pope heard what Stalin had to say, the Pope replied, quote, when you see our son Joseph again, tell him that he will meet our divisions in heaven, close quote. It's an odd retort, uh, and I can't imagine that uh, Stalin would be found in heaven with or without his troops. But yet, anyway, this quote of, of, of Stalin tells us something about the authority of our courts. The courts do not have an army to enforce their decisions, and they cannot legislate compliance. Their orders are not self-executing. They rely on the executive branch to enforce their decisions, and on the executive branch for their financial resources and their jurisdiction. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, made the case for the courts being the least dangerous branch in Federalist Paper Number 78 for this specific reason. He said the executive branch holds the sword of the community. The legislative commands the purse. But, and I'm quoting, the judiciary has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or of the wealth of the society and can take no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment, close quote. In the final analysis, the courts rely on the respect and the confidence of the public for their ultimate legitimacy and authority. Without it, their orders are nothing but words on paper. If a judge is perceived as simply a politician in a black robe, where then do our courts stand in our carefully structured system of government? Confidence in our courts is in decline. The Gallup poll each year measures confidence in the Supreme Court. In their 2019 poll, if we combine those who said they have a great deal of confidence in the court and quite a lot of confidence, confidence in the Supreme Court, it adds up to only 36%, not even a majority. And this is part of a downward trend. In 1973, 45% of those polled said they had a great deal of confidence or, or quite a lot of confidence in the Supreme Court. Yes, this is better than Congress with only 11% uh, having uh, such confidence in the public, but that's surely cold comfort. Respect for our courts cannot be taken for granted. These are not easy questions and no easy answers. Yet I am proud that we have had a Judge Brodsky and I would not want to do anything to strip away his right as a judge to speak on the great issues of his time. Will there be others whose views we abhor? Yes. Will we protest? Of course. Perhaps the answer is more prosaic than principled. It may depend on how often a judge steps outside of the limited judicial function to speak on broader issues. Our system can tolerate the occasional exercise of a judge using a bully pulpit. In fact, one could say that our, that our system requires a judge at times to step outside and use his bullet pulpit. Nelson Mandela said, quote, I was not a messiah, but an ordinary man who had become a leader because of extraordinary circumstances, close quote. And there is great truth that extraordinary circumstances require an extraordinary response. And when that response is not coming from the other branches of government, we can accept it from the judiciary. In fact, there are times when we need to accept it but the times must be truly extraordinary. As for judges like Judge Brodsky, who felt the urgent need to speak the truth, rather than some form of proscription or sanction, I would rather rely on the observation of Augustine of Hippo, who said, quote, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself, close quote. And that is exactly what happened to Judge Brodsky. Judge Brodsky's truth about the Third Reich he let it loose and history has defended his truth. And there's one more truth that I want to be, that I am confident about. 
If Judge Brodsky were alive today, he'd be standing with Stand With Us in its critical mission to battle anti-Semitism, to educate our youth about Zionism and to bring the truth about Israel to our campuses. Stand With Us plays an essential role in the same fight against anti-Semitism, whether clothed in traditional forms or in anti-Zionism that motivated Judge Brodsky 85 years ago. Judge Brodsky's struggle has been passed on to us. So I wanna thank all of you uh, for listening and I wanna thank Stan with us for giving me this opportunity. Jonathan. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was fascinating. And you can tell we have a lot of lawyers on this call based on some of the questions that are coming in. And before I get to some of those, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. We had people commenting from Norway, Spain, Serbia, Cyprus, of course, Israel, Canada, all over the United States. Uh, it's, it's really great to have everybody here. And thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. And this was a truly fascinating little known incident in time as uh, we discussed in your background. So let's get to some of the questions and, and hopefully we'll have time to answer, answer all of them, but we'll certainly get to a few. Given his background and political activities, why wasn't Judge Brodsky required to recuse himself from this case? Well, he um, first of all, there was there was no um, motion to recuse him himself. Um, I think that when the case was assigned to him, everyone thought it was fairly uh, non-controversial. Um, it was a, a preliminary hearing. It wasn't the trial itself. Uh, he had not previously commented on this matter, so it's not as if he had taken a position uh, on this incident uh, uh, previously. Um, and uh, I don't think that anyone gave it much uh, much thought. Uh, as I said, the issue before him was simply whether or not there was sufficient evidence to move on to a trial. Okay. Do you sense a comparison between the 1933 journey into Nazi Germany oppression against Jews and today's escalating anti-Semitism on campuses across the U.S. and elsewhere? Just based on that story, and then looking a little bit, because you mentioned Students for Justice in Palestine and, and campus issues, and this, of course, is what we deal with at the Stand With Us Legal Department on pretty much a daily basis. Well, you know, I, I think we, we could sometimes um, go too far in, um, in analogizing specific factual patterns. Um, obviously, what was happening in the 1930s um, was um, a sui generis uh, situation um, where Hitler was uh, laying the groundwork for the annihilation of, uh, of Jews. But I do think that um, the incident tells us that we have to always be on alert for anti-Semitism, whether on the right or the left. And we have to be willing to stand up early on before it takes on a, a life of its own. I will also say that um, in, in the incident I talked about, uh, it's not as if uh, Jews were alone or Judge Brodsky was alone. Uh, we had a lot of supporters. Um, uh, the mayor of New York at the time, uh, LaGuardia, uh, was, a, was a terrific supporter and a fervent anti-Nazi. Um, after, um, uh, after the flag was thrown into the Hudson, uh, Goebbels, uh, again, the propaganda minister um, who was outraged, uh, demanded that New York take steps to protect the German consulate. So what LaGuardia did was he, he took 10 detectives and sent them over to the consulate to protect them. All 10 were Jewish. They had obviously Jewish names, names like uh, uh, Goldfarb and um, Gersten. And when uh, Goebbels heard that it was Jews who were uh, guarding his, um, uh, his consulate, he said, get them out of there. I don't want, I don't want them uh, guarding our people, not those inferior bastards is what he said. But I say this, this incident to say that um, Jews then had very, very uh, uh, critical supporters. And that's what's important today, that good people speak out so that um, the voices of hatred, whether from the left or the right, know that it's not gonna be tolerated in this country because decent, respectful people who are um, a part of our leadership in this country speak out. Absolutely. Uh, some questions about the case. Who were the prosecutors on behalf of the state of New York and were the First Amendment issues raised or did the judge raise on his own? And I know you touched a little bit on this towards the end. Uh, the, the, I, I don't recall the name of the prosecutor. It was, um, it was someone who was um, uh, in the office uh, there. The uh, defense counsel are kind of interesting. Um, one of the defense counsel uh, was from the, um, uh, the Siemens Union. The other was a, um, a firebrand um, a congressman uh, who was a very well-known um, trial lawyer, and he came in to, to, to argue for them. Um, there, there was no First Amendment issue that, that was raised um, in, the, um, in the hearing. However, in oral argument, the lawyers for the uh, Bremen Six did 
try to make the claim that um, the flag was a provocation. And what they said to Judge Brodsky, and I found this very, very interesting, they said to him, if all you do is find that there's insufficient evidence to bind these defendants over for trial, it's not enough. They didn't say Dayenu, but that's what they meant. And they said, we need you to speak out. We need you to call out this regime for what it was. Um, and um, I, I didn't see in the record any um, uh, objection by the, uh, by the district attorney to that. But uh, there certainly was an effort by the defense counsel to call attention to the broader issues in, in the case as they saw them. Absolutely. Now, could a judge of a higher court in the circuit overturn his ruling as it was essentially an indictment hearing to, to bind it up to a higher court? Well, the, um, remember, all he, all he found was that uh, there was insufficient evidence uh, to go forward uh, 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 for trial. Um, that, that's not a, really a, a binding precedent. Um, the DA could have theoretically later have come up with more evidence. Um, and we, one, would, one would view the comments that uh, Judge Brodsky made uh, as, as really his, his opinion uh, on, on what was happening in Nazi Germany and its effects on common decent people. And regardless of what a, of a court of appeal might do, if, if they even had jurisdiction, which I don't think they, they would have had in this situation, um, uh, his, his, his comments would, would just, would, would, remain, uh, would remain there. I might also say that uh, I had mentioned that the, the Bremen Six had been um, charged with unlawful assembly and also assault on a police officer. Now that's really interesting because the police officer was a Jewish detective who had been um, uh, assigned by the New York Police Department to actually protect the Brennan. They had gotten word ahead of time that some type of um, uh, incident was planned. They had followed one of the Bremen Six and this police officer had actually tried to, uh, to, to protect the sovereignty of Germany. Uh, putting his uh, official duties um, beyond his own um, uh, beliefs. And what, um, what Judge um, Brodsky found was one, there was insufficient evidence on the unlawful assembly as to all six. Uh, there was uh, insufficient evidence of attacking um, this judge, this uh, lawyer for five of them. He did say there's enough evidence uh, of attacking the detective with respect to one of the defendants. That case did go to trial. And um, the jury was out, I think, for an hour before finding him not guilty. Hmm. Now, was there, was there an appeal? No. There was no appeal on no this appeal. case? Okay. No appeal, Now, I know there was obviously some press coverage of the incident. I'm curious as to how much, we're, we're talking a completely different time period than we are today, but how much press was there? Obviously, it was, it was played on in Germany. It was, it was a little bit in the news here. You saw the different reactions by the US government, different branches of government. How can you talk a little bit about the press? Yeah, no, there, there was a fair amount of press coverage. Uh, it, was, it was pretty unprecedented for a judge to do what, what he did. The, the incident itself uh, had attracted a lot of attention uh, in, in the press. So this, this was, this was a, a matter that was really uh, right in the public eye. Uh, the, crowd, the, the, um, the courtrooms were crowded. There was a lot of press covering, uh, covering this. Uh, so there was a there was a, a a lot of press coverage, and I I will also mention that after Judge Brodsky issued his opinion, uh, he received thousands of letters. Um, many of them were in support of of what he did. Some were attacking him, but that's certainly an indication of the type of coverage that this case got. Absolutely, uh, a jurisdictional question: How did Judge Brodsky have jurisdiction since this took place on a ship, thereby limiting jurisdiction to federal maritime courts? Well, uh, I don't. I don't recall anyone raising it, but I do believe that. Um, uh, I mean, the ship was 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 docked, was uh, moored in uh, in New York, New York Harbor, um, uh, and um, I, I don't know if at the time um, uh, New York had had a separate um, uh, had a, had a separate uh, maritime division. Now, one might say, if there were maritime jurisdiction, and I, I don't know if there were, that maybe it would go to the federal courts. Uh, and there was a real effort by the German government to get the United States on a federal level to do something. But, but the State Department uh, had really had no interest in it. Um, some could say the State Department uh, just wanted to downplay this incident as much as possible. They claimed, the State Department said to Germany, listen, this is a local matter. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction here. Uh, so um, I think um, uh, everyone in our government was perfectly content to let this play out in a, in, a, in a local state court. 
in terms of the defendants themselves, were, were they, in, if you know this, were they active uh, in any anti-Nazi activities after this incident? Uh, well, I know most about Bill Bailey. Um, and as I said, at the time of the incident, he was 20 years old. He was a, he was a, a fervent communist. Uh, in the 1930s later, he, uh, he fought in the, um, in, in, the, in the Civil War in Spain, joined the, um, the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade um, and, uh, and fought there. Uh, af afterwards, um, he uh, he was in the um, uh, sort of one of the leadership positions uh, in in one of the unions, uh, spokesperson for one of the unions in the 1950s. Then, when the McCarthy era came in, and because Bill Bailey was a communist, he was uh, he was thrown out of that position, and then became a um, um, a, a seaman, a, 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 a longshoreman. Um, but he, uh, his, his whole life, uh, he was a committed uh, communist and uh, fervent uh, anti-Nazi. Interesting. And what about Judge Brodsky's descendants? Do you know if they were activists? Do you have any information on his family? Well, he, um, he, he was married. He had one daughter. Um, and um, I, I, I tried looking uh, to see uh, who they were and, and what they did. Um, and uh, there really wasn't uh, anything. Um, it, it just kind of uh, died uh, there. Um, he, um, he lived a long life. Uh, uh, as I said, I think he was uh, 86 years old, um, and he was, a, he was an outspoken judge. Uh, this wasn't the only case of his that attracted a lot of attention. Uh, prior, I think it was prior to this case, um, he had a matter brought to him uh, of, a, of a woman who was um, uh, arrested for indecent exposure for dancing nude in one of the bars in, uh, in, in New York. And he threw, it out, he threw out the charges, and he said, um, uh, uh, dancing nude is not indecent, in uh, uptown New York bars, and uh, and uh, just threw that out. So he, he, he this was a guy who um, was 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 used to uh, giving his uh, salty opinions. Another question about Judge Brodsky: Do we know from uh, any any FOIA request whether FBI whether the FBI opened a file on Judge Brodsky as a communist sympathizer after this incident? Well, that's a that, that's a very interesting question, and, and I don't know, and that would be a really wonderful uh, request. Uh, I, I don't think he, you know, he wasn't a communist uh, sympathizer. There's there's no evidence that uh, he he was a a, a communist. Um, uh, in fact, uh, before he became a judge, uh, he ran for Congress um, and um, was obviously was not um, was not elected. And uh, unless I'm mistaken, I think he. Uh, he, he ran as a, as a Republican, uh, but I'll have to go back and, and check on that. Do you know if there are any death threats against him? Obviously, there were, you got hate mail, you said, uh, and, and much supporter, and many supporter of uh, letters written as well. Were there any death threats against him? And do you know if he got any protection? Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't read anything about any protection then. I wouldn't be surprised if there were death threats. I mean, one reason why I, I tried to um, uh, find out if he had any uh, descendants alive today so I could talk to them was to ask those sort of questions. Um, but um, I, I've, I've got to believe that within the thousands of letters that he got, there were some pretty unsavory ones. Do you know about any books about the defendants? Uh, yeah, there, 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 there are. There's a, there's, a, there's a recent book called The Agitator um, uh, that, that came out and it, it talks about um, uh, this, uh, this incident, focusing mainly on, um, on Bill Bailey. Uh, starting with his uh, early childhood and and uh, and, and taking him uh, through through the end, uh, it's a, it's a very very good good book um, uh, by Peter Duffy. Uh, then um, uh, Bill Bailey himself um, wrote an autobiography. Uh, it was called um, the the kid from Hoboken, um, and he co-wrote it with someone. I haven't read that one, um, but um, I, I understand that um, after this incident, um, uh, he uh, he went around talking about, especially at union meetings, and he became um, uh, somewhat of a, of a, of a celebrity uh, because of it. So there, 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 are, there are several books out there that, 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 that touch on it. Um, and then with all the different players in there, there's, there, there's different books that focus on, obviously, uh, Henry Ford and, and, and his, um, his, his anti-Semitism. Uh, he, with Ford, it's really interesting that uh, he and Hitler, uh, it was a mutual admiration society. They, they both admired each other uh, quite, quite a bit. And um, uh, Ford um, was, um, w w was quite openly uh, uh, an anti-Semite. And a uh, follow-up question for, for those interested in more material, where can we find a copy of Judge Brodsky's 14-page opinion? Wow, I, uh, I don't know. I, in fact, I haven't read the whole thing. I've read excerpts of it. Um, and I, I've gone online and I haven't found that. Um, but um, 
I, I would I would think that um, uh, it, it has to exist somewhere in the court archives. Um, and I think it would be really worthwhile reading the whole thing from beginning to end. Excellent. All right. One final question. Uh, and I do apologize for any questions that did not get answered. There were a lot today. And thank you all who submitted questions. And thank you again for joining. Uh, has anything like this happened more in recent times? Ooh, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, there, uh, I, I can't think of specific instances, but, but there are occasions when judges do comment and, and go outside the record uh, and, 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 and talk about um, the, uh, the, the, the swirling um, uh, issues that uh, revolve around the case. You know, there's a, um, th there is a, a difference today in some of the briefing that's done um, back, um, back in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, you lawyer, the lawyers on the call probably uh, uh, recall something called the Brandeis brief, where what um, uh, Louis Brandeis did uh, as a lawyer, uh, it was an innovation of his, uh, he wanted to make sure that the legal issue before the judge was not presented in a cold clinical way, but he would dress it up with what is going on in society. What, what, are the, uh, uh, what, what are the forces in society and the culture that are pushing this legal issue to the forefront so judges could have that sort of perspective. Today, we see many more briefs uh, that, that adopt that approach. It's quite common in, in, in the Supreme Court, uh, in fact, to see that. Um, so there, there, I think today we are a little more accustomed to judges um, uh, moving a bit outside of the record uh, to, um, to, to comment on things. Uh, and um, uh, as, as long as it's done uh, infrequently, and as I said, as long as it's extraordinary circumstances, I think it's something that not only our system can tolerate, but every once in a while, we need a jolt of truth. Great. Well, this has been fascinating. Carrie, I want to thank you so much for this excellent webinar for both the Stand With Us Side Off Legal Department and for Stand With Us Connect. And thank you, of course, for supporting our mission to stand up for Israel and fight anti-Semitism around the world. All right. Well, thank uh, you all. Our pleasure. Before we, before we close, I want to tell everyone again, if you love the work of Stand With Us, you can donate and support us however you like with whatever you can at standwithus.com backslash donate. If you enjoyed this session, you can book a private webinar for your own group via standwithusconnect.com. Thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful day.